Let's welcome Dr. Iqbal. Thank you, Dr. Brito, for the kind introduction. And I can understand uh, it's always a fresh feeling when we meet, so he thought I've been just fresh <laughs> on UT campus. So it's been a privilege to be here, and uh, I thank Dean of uh, Library, Evelyn Sylvia, for making it happen. And it was a humbling experience to see my pictures. I have never seen my pictures <laughs> in such a big enlargement before. So and that, that builds a burden on me as well to course we have been doing some good works thanks to good students that we have because they are the ones who actually do the legwork we just talk <laughs> and type a little bit so it's because of the those students who have worked so all the work that I'll be showing today has been enabled because of other people who have been willing to uh, come together work together and talk together across the boundaries so that's something which is uh, uh, distinct in what we do, we work across boundaries. So I'm an electrical engineer. My undergrad was uh, electrical engineer. I served in military for a few years before I went to grad school, and then uh, my research shifted towards much more on biosensing. So today, what I'll talk about is uh, uh, a little bit on what is nanotechnology, what has enabled. Uh, us to make things at smaller scale and how does that give us this capability to do something for living systems or something to detect disease especially cancer and within these different types of cancers but more importantly breast cancer so we have done some recent work on breast cancer and since this is breast cancer awareness month so i thought to showcase some of our work that is focused on that so on, before we go into it, I like to show things on size and scale. We all are accustomed, accustomed to things at large scale, things that we can see, we can handle, we can uh, feel, right? But then there are things which are in nature, which exist at small scale. And let me ask you, what is the smallest thing that you can see with naked eye? Smallest thing without using any equipment, what is the smallest thing that you see in everyday life, or probably every day in the morning, especially some of us, all day. Salt. salt, grain of salt, hey. something that I have much more on me hey. here. So here is uh, 100 microns. 100 micron is is something that falls uh, here, right? So and and if you see the whole list of, or whole range of living things, so organs which are a few millimeters, hundreds of millimeters. Then as we go down, there are things, at cells here, and we have bacteria, and we have recently uh, a lot of uh, talk about virus. The virus fall in the range of a few to 100 nanometers. And as we push down, we have uh, various proteins, we hear a lot about DNA, right? And DNA is a molecule that carries genetic information, right? And what is genetic information? How do you define genetic information? What is that information that's carried from parents to kids? Can determine the sex of the person? So, then that's something which gets determined, but what are the traits that we inherit from our parents? It's the color of skin, color of eyes, color of hair. There is a propensity for diseases as well, right? So we might be carrying genes which, uh, which makes us susceptible to different diseases. So this, there's all that information in there, which now we are learning a lot about, especially after Human Genome Project. We, have, we know many of the genes now. We know many of the sequences that uh, are encoded in, in DNA. But on the other side, something has been happening which has resulted in this electronic devices 
that we carry ourselves with, a, with almost all of us have cell phones and if you have a cell phone put it to silence <laughs> <laughs> so cell phones think about it our cell phones have million times more memory than we had it on Apollo mission so think about it how far we have come but what enabled that uh, just that drastic evolution in devices it's silicon industry it's microelectronics right so now we have many more uh, even uh, more density than neurons in our brain on our devices so that has resulted into these uh, interesting new uh, ways and, and interesting new features that we can make at nanoscale we cannot just make them at nanoscale we can make them reproducibly and we can make them, uh, we can have a lot more control over their dimensions and their chemical nature. Why is that important? We'll see as we, as we move on. So talking about these things, we know a lot about organs and tissues using equipment like x-rays or CT scan or MRIs, right? We don't have too many uh, equipment or too many sensing systems that can look at living things at smaller scale. We are developing some, like we are using 3D printing. This is a, a figure from our own UTARI, UTA Research Institute, which is, so they can do this prototyping, fast prototyping, but it's still micro scale. And then we have these microfluidics, so this is one cent, so we can make these small channels in in plastic uh, sort of disks and do lots of processing, the similar processing that we used to do in tubes in a lab. If you have taken chemistry 101, we used to mix things and sometimes you mix things where you see lots of fumes coming out or some of us would have the, the lots of scare going on. But those things can be done now at, at very minute scale. So that's called microfluidics. But now we have much more information on this side and we have much more control on the, on the other side, what we call narrow scale objects or narrow scale uh, uh, nanopores, cantilevers, nanowires, nanotubes. So these are giving us capability to interface human at different scales and, and different, for different conditions. So this is just a, picture of mini me, those who, have, <laughs> those who remember, it's been a few years now, more than 15 years. So and that also tells us the size scale that we have mini me, which is about one meter, then we have a centimeter, a millimeter, then if you divide it further by another thousand, we have what you call MEMS, microelectromechanical systems, and if you divide it by another thousand, a million, a millionth of a meter, then you get what you call nanometer. And these can be directly interfaced with living things at that scale. So viruses, DNA, proteins. And if you have, and, and we'll discuss, if you have things that can interface proteins at nanoscale, we might be able to look at uh, their behavior at micro scale and micro scale being cells. And when we talk about cells, disease, diseases are essentially cells that have gone bad, especially in case of cancer. So how do we, how can we use these to look at cancer? So this is another example of how far microelectronics have come. So we can make these chips, which are, uh, there are so many dyes on, a, on one eight inch wafer and we have 2.7 billion transistors, which is essentially uh, one third of human population. So we, have, we can make that many on one of those chips that we carry around in our pockets. So this is the kind of uh, strength, this is the kind of microelectronic uh, sort of control that we have received out that we can do the same thing that we used to do in uh, in a PCR machine, which takes so much space, it takes so much time, and we can do the same process 
in what we call a micro PCR chip. A micro PCR chip is, if you guys uh, are familiar with the, the TV shows like CSI, where they take DNA samples and they send it to lab where they wait for match. So essentially what happens in the lab is they amplify the DNA and that amplification uh, thing or process is called PCR. So this is generally done at, uh, with a machine called PCR machine and they, the same thing can be done on a PCR chip. Now the, if you look at the size, you can essentially see that requirement of the sample can be drastically small. So not just that, we can have much more information in much smaller time. So legal forensic being just one application where we need faster results. There are other areas where we need faster results. We, uh, in my case, I would like to have uh, what we are doing. We want to have quick results on a disease. We want to find out if somebody has propensity for disease, especially looking at genes. If somebody has already acquired a disease, looking at certain proteins that they produce. And thinking about those proteins, guess so, but we all have heard about what you call, uh, when somebody has a cardiovascular disease or propensity, we get checked for a certain molecule. What do we call that? So some people who have elevated levels of that molecule, they have they are advised to stop eating meat. They have to start taking statin. What do we call that molecule? Cholesterol. 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 So cholesterol is a molecule which tells us propensity for a person to have heart disease. Heart disease. Pro propensity to for a person to create plaques in the arteries and ultimately result into so when my doctor told me that I have high cholesterol and I have to change my lifestyle, I changed the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially the levels of these things, they tell us what's going on inside. And similar, if you get blood tests done and we see high level of uh, white blood cells, what does that tell us about us? Infection. Certain, certain maybe there's some infection going on. It, because of that, our body is producing high number of white blood cells, and then we can get for. So why I'm bringing this up because these are all biomarkers, and we have those samples available to detect those. But for diseases like cancer and diseases that yet uh, need to have early diagnostics, diagnostic tool, we still have this uh, list of things that need to be done. We need to have. Uh, a way of doing minimum sample preparation so we can do it without need of a, a, a very well established lab. We may be able, we should be able to do it on the field. We should be able to extract maximum information out of that. Should be label free, which is another way of saying we don't want to do too many sample mixing. We just want it to be whatever it is and get the information out of it. Should be accurate should use very small amount of sample, should be able to detect many targets, integrated and fast, but ultimate goal is the cost and time. We should be able to do it really quick, should be able to do it at uh, low cost. So this is where nanotechnology or, or what we call MEMS, micro electron, micro, electron, uh, micro electromechanical systems or micro electronic systems, they come in. They can do diagnostic at biomarker level, which is essentially those molecules, like uh, uh, for heart diseases or for neurological diseases, but we are finding more biomarkers for cancer diseases as well. It should be able to do it at high sensitivity. And the sensitivity is a concern where we want to detect very small amount of those molecules. And why do we why are we concerned with small amount of molecules? Almost all of us have heard or have the misfortune to know someone who got diagnosed with cancer and he or she was told that it was too late. What does it mean for it to be too late? Because we don't have diagnostic tools that can detect it at early stages of cancer. They are not sensitive enough. 
So sensitivity is a major factor there. And selectivity is, is the other factor where we don't want to miss it. Even if we have system that's sensitive enough, it may give us false results, right? So if I get false positive for being pregnant, I can really get <laughs> checked out and they will find out, okay, I'm not. But if somebody has cancer and, and gets false negative, that's, that's going to be horrible, right? Because somebody is having a disease and the test says that you don't, so then the disease will keep on progressing. So selectivity is that concept which we are getting from nanotechnology or MEMS. Nanomedicine, personalized uh, medicine is, has to do much more with not every uh, cancer is the same, so every person needs to be treated differently. Not, so chemotherapy, drugs like chemotherapy, they give the same drug to every person. So that drug doesn't work well for each person. So personalized medicine, possibly we can, we can know that who has what kind of genes and what kind of proteins are getting, expen getting expressed and results into uh, into focused and targeted uh, and, and we'll see in case of breast cancer that is, this is a concern they have one size fit all which doesn't work for treating disease like breast cancer of course then there are applications in legal where it can be used for paternity immigration forensics so some of the devices are already out there some of the system things that use a point of care interface with living things are already there. Glucose meter is a simple example. So what you will see in all these tests and all these kits, they are point of care. You can just buy them off the shelf, get a test done, gives you an answer. But we don't have similar things for so many diseases. And there is politics behind, there is lack of uh, uh, order and priorities behind it. So if you look at this chart, there is so much funding that's going for diseases which are not the major killers. So you see that the cancer being the major killer is getting uh, the funding which is nowhere there compared to TB, malaria, HIV, AIDS. So this is something also results into misplaced uh, focus on where we should be working on. Another piece of data where we can see that the mortality because of uh, cardiovascular diseases has drastically gone down. Other diseases has gone significantly down over about 60, 61 years, but it's still about the same because of cancer. So one needs to think back and see what may be the reason. Of course, they can be. Uh, there are there are social issues. There are people are eating more healthy diet. There are better uh, uh, drugs to use against those diseases. But everything being the same, cancer is still the major killer among all those diseases. So, and, and especially now, even if we are listening, we are hearing a lot of work going on on breast cancer. There is still people dying because of metastasis. It's only the lung cancer which is causing more deaths than, uh, than breast cancer. Now for breast cancer, the interesting thing about it that we can treat the primary tumor site. We can remove the primary tumor. But more, uh, most of the times the deaths are because of the secondary tumor. The secondary tumor being that the primary tumor, what we call, spreads to other organs, right? But the technical term is metastasizes, right? It metastasizes to other organs. Not all breast cancer tumors are metastatic. But what happens is once somebody is diagnosed with, met with cancer, the same treatment is given to every patient which results into over-treatment. So over-treatment, one part of that treatment is radiation. Radiation causes cancer by itself. So many of the, most of the patients who die from breast cancer do not die because of the primary tumor, but they die because of the secondary tumors, which 
may occur because of the metastasis of the original one or because of the treatment itself. So that is something that we have been working on that how do we uh, identify number one tumor at early stage, number two distinguish where the stage of the tumor, distinguish the metastatic potential of the tumor because if you know the metastatic potential then only then somebody should be treated with aggressive treatment otherwise should not be placed under aggressive treatment because aggressive treatment results into cancer by itself so this is again some data on breast cancer and, and, uh, and well, 20 to 30 percent are known to become metastatic but what we do generally is we, we treat everyone with the same treatment and we have to understand something before we understand about cancer. And, and I don't mean to understand Wolverine, <laughs> but I want you to think about what is special about X-Men. Mutants. Mutants. What, so being mutant, what is special about them? They're hard to kill. Right? And, and they have certain abnormal properties which are different, right? Which gives them that survival rate. Do you guys know this lady? What do we call her? Mystique. Mystique. What is special about this one? She was in that movie where teenagers kill other teenagers. Hunger Games. <laughs> and it's popular. Hunger Games. Hunger Games. So it's, it's, it's Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence. But the point I'm making here is that, yeah, this is how Marvel defined them. So this comes off of their website. So they are different, heroic, special powers, and they used to protect mutants and that. But that's something that half of the statement is true for cancer. They have become mutants, they have special powers, and they are not there to protect others. They are, they are there to protect each other, yes, but not the host uh, organ. And this is something which we see in the form of certain properties that those cells acquire. And once, and talking about the, the certain properties that those cells acquire, we all carry same genome, right? But different parts of our body express different parts of the genome, which makes our smelling cells to be different than our uh, eyeball cells, which are transparent, or our cells of our fingernails, which are uh, hard. So similarly, cancer cells, once they become, so they, are, they were originally cells of that organ, but once they become cancerous, they acquire certain properties. So some of their genes, they get mutated, they result into. So this is a chart which is showing some of the known biomarkers and biomarker again, something like uh, cholesterol. What they do is they, they tell us their overexpression or down regulation in that cell is results into that abnormal behavior of the cells. And we know now many biomarkers. And, and if you make a look at, at a list, there is you'll see there's one common biomarker called EGFR among many cancers. So EGFR <coughs> is something which is a growth factor receptor. So growth factor receptor, it's a molecule on the wall of the cells, which tells the cell to grow once it receives another molecule from blood or serum, right? A normal behavior. But once these EGFR become too many on the cell wall, which is the cancer state, which is a cancer state, then they all tell cancer to divide, so which, which ultimately results into cancer cells growing much faster and dividing much faster and taking over the control and taking over the nutrition. So we have been using this biomarker to look for cancer cells from simple solutions like blood, urine, saliva, and why do we want to look for these in these simple solutions? That's a, 
another question which has been recently become important that now we know that once a primary tumor starts takes hold they some of the cells they break apart and they travel and what is the easiest way to travel in a body bloodstream right so they somehow find their way get into the bloodstream and they are the when there are few uh, very few at the start our immune system can get rid of them uh, once they the number starts going up they survive some of them do survive and ultimately they find the secondary sites where they can form a new colony right so now we have this opportunity that if we can take couple of milliliters of blood in annual physical we should be able to we we can use this uh, those cells to look we should be fishing for those cells and find if they are there but the problem is there are too few we have a billion of so normal cells or 5 to 10 tumor cells very hard to detect so that's question of sensitivity so our focus has been to develop tools where we might be able to look for those cells at the onset of disease at the start of disease when they are too few so uh something that we have used to do that is another molecule called aptamer so we aptamers are kind of uh, are nucleic acids dna or rna which have been known to bind to certain molecules so we have a, an aptamer of which we got from a collaborator at austin that is known to bind to egfr very well so we use that for now we are using that to detect many types of cancer so this is a, a list of uh, where this is known to be uh, expressed egfr is known to be expressed and 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 we are using it to for detect breast cancer but for, to detect brain tumors to detect lung cancer <coughs> to detect the recent grant on on the bladder cancer so the problem with breast cancer is mammography is not a definite diagnosis so it's it, it's debated we all know there's so much debate goes on about this biopsy gives us a definite answer but then it is invasive and, and even in bi- biopsy we may not know whether the there are metastatic potential or not and we know why we want to know metastatic potential of breast cancer tissue so generally everybody gets the same treatment which is over treatment for many of the patients so there is need especially for breast cancer that we need to have non invasive tool and even if we have an invasive tool like biopsy we need to have better screening way we need to have better way to look at the the tissue that's been taken out to look for metastatic potential because that's important for the prognosis of disease there's nothing that exists to do that we can see and we can tell if the cells are cancerous or not that's it we cannot tell whether they are metastatic or not when non metastatic which is important for the ultimate prognosis so we need to have something which is non invasive painless easy and gives us early detection not just that we should be able to use it for prognosis monitoring so we want to make sure we need to have something that we can uh, use to see how the drug or how the therapy is is helping the patient so overall we need a cell based diagnostic and i'll show you the work that we have done where we want to start with the sample and do some prep or may not do some prep and detect it and get an answer so what we are doing is, is off chip concentration recovery put it on chip concentrate it get our cells that we want get our tumor cells and wash everything else and then detect those cells and count them and find their behavior so their behavior is something which i'll show you we have seen tumor cells behave very differently once they are on the surface of a chip than a normal cell and then should be able to identify what is the source of those tumor cells because if you find tumor cells in blood we don't know 
which part of the body are they coming from, right? So what organ has been affected that's shedding those tumor cells? So one thing that we're using is called a micropore. So micropore is, is nothing but a, a, a sort of a quarter counter, uh, let me skip, let me show you. It says quarter counter type of thing. Quarter counter, if you're not familiar, is used in uh, tissue engineering where you want to count cells. So essentially we have a micro scale hole and we run, uh, we have electrodes on either sides on both sides and we measure ionic current. So as soon as a cell passes through, we see a drop in current. And once the cell is gone through, the, the ionic current gets back to its original level, right? So that cell, how does it pass through? How much time does it take? How much of the uh, area of the micropore it, it blocks? Tells us a lot about the cell itself. So. Before we go into that, so we want to see from micropore, number one, cancer staging. Then what is the stage of the cancer? We guys know what is, we, we hear early stage or late stage, two stage, three stage, four. These are all, they tell us how far is cancer, how far cancer has progressed. So the stage four is where a patient has a, a few weeks to a few months to survive. So we want to know from the, the sample itself, how far is the cancer from the cell behavior itself. And that we can find out from whether it's non-metastatic or whether it's metastatic tumor cell. And that can tell us. And there are other people who are doing that. So there are ways where they are uh, interacting with cells using atomic, micro, uh, atomic force microscope, They're using magnetic beads. They are pipetting out the cells and seeing the force it takes to pipette it, aspirate. They're using uh, these lights to trap, the focused light beams to trap a cell. They're, they're pushing this into two uh, plates and they are using membranes to, to see how the cells behave. But in all those cases, we have to uh, be it's very hard to process the whole cell. You can take one cell and do something on that cell. But life is not one cell. Life is you need to have many cells and then see the behavior of, of so many of them. So that's something that we can do with micropores. It's just a fabrication step. So we do the whole nine years of fabrication in a narrow tech research center here on the other side of campus. So west end of UTA. So that's where we do most of it. As our setup, everything is home built, and this red one is cells, the tumor, uh, the, the blood sample coming through, or a sample from biopsy, which would be tissue, and you have to digest the matrix and get the cells, and you push them through, and what you get is you get this kind of data from the passage of. Cells. So this is for non-metastatic tumor cell, this is for metastatic tumor cell. <coughs> Excuse me. And what you see is that they have drastically different behavior once they are going through. So non-metastatic cells take longer, metastatic cells move faster. That tells us something about the cells. Non-metastatic cells are bad. Of course. <coughs> Excuse me. Metastatic tumor cells are worse. So for their shape-shifting behavior, going back to that mystique idea, these can squeeze through. They are the same in size, but these can squeeze through much easily, much faster. They can just change the shape. Now think about it. Cell is not a soft entity. Cells have their integrity. Cells have their honor. <laughs> they don't like to be squeezed out. But these guys are scavengers. These guys are bad. They are so they just don't care. They pass through. But what we see when once you plot them on this on a same scatter plot, you see that this, they have very distinct behavior. Then so metastatic tumor cells show very distinct behavior from non-metastatic tumor cells. And this is something for the first time we have seen that you can. Uh, 
instead of doing one cell at a time, you can run those cells and within a couple of hours, you can see this data. So think about it, if I give my, for biopsy, if I give out a biopsy sample within a couple of hours, we should be able to see if stage it, number two, number one, stage it, number two, see whether the, the patient has is prone to secondary tumor, prone to metastasis <coughs> already. So it's just numbers and difference in, in all those things. We have done mixtures where we have done one to one or one to 10 ratio and both cases we see they discriminate from each other. So they see difference between their behavior from each other. Something which is uh, we have recently submitted for publication in cancer a journal called Cancer. So we'll see how it goes. There's another approach where many uh, sensors they use what you call a functionalized surface. So you put down your molecule and then you flow in something which if it's complementary to that surface, it binds to it. And then you can measure them if they are bound or not. So in case of living things or cancer cells, this is a synthetic structure, a synthetic surface, right? We don't like cold, hard surfaces, right? We like cozy, cushions. <laughs> Cells are the same thing. So they don't like a, a synthetic, a foreign environment. But we saw something which is, which uh, we have been exploring now for a couple of years, that tumor cells have uh, show very different behavior on the surface of a chip than a normal cell in contrast to normal cells. So you have to understand the same thing that the tumor cells have uh, this overexpression of EGFR which is uh, an order or more for between non-metastatic and metastatic cells and it's about million times different from normal cells. So normal cells also have EGFR in it. So a simple example of that would be, so we, we know cloths, different clothes have different kind of uh, lint on it so to speak. So if I was wearing a wool sweater, it would have more lint on it. So if you uh, throw a ball with, the, with that, uh, what do you call, Velcro on it, it's, it has much more uh, liking for that woolen sweater than this planar surface. So it has less lint, that has more lint. So similarly, a normal cell has certain expression of EGFR, but Tumor cell has a million times more expression of EGFR. So it is much more rich in that receptor on the surface. So it's much more prone to bind to a surface that has uh, this receptor, this aptamer, which is known to bind to uh, this EGFR receptor. So this is the property that we use to functionalize our surface. And what we see is once the tumor cell comes in contact, it just loves it, just spreads on it. And normal cells, they don't like it. They just come in contact and go away. And some data on those cells. So this is from brain tumor cells. And I'll show you uh, what we have found on breast cancer cells as well. So over course of a uh, few minutes, we can see that those cells, they love the surface. They are alive and kicking. They are trying to make contact. They are spreading. They are growing. But unlike normal cells, so this, when you look at the data for normal cells, so these lower two panes are for normal cells, so they don't show any such behavior. So this was back in 2010, where we observed that these brain tumor cells and normal cells from brain, they have have very distinct different behavior, which can be directly used as a cytology tool for, for the clinicians who can just look at the sample and they can see the difference in a, on a functionalized chip. Something else that crossed us a few years ago is, is the recent uh, study on what you call basement membrane. So basement membrane is this essential part of our support of our tissue, which keeps the tissue intact and away from the bloodstream. 
but the metastatic tumor cells are, and it's a strong membrane but they are known to pass through this membrane before they get into bloodstream and this is the texture of this membrane now so this shows a very uh, profound level of uh, randomness so to speak on that surface so we went out to create nano texture and to see if that texture is going to change our uh, device efficiency and, and there are many steps in between you want to make sure you get much more molecules that get absorbed because think about it if if this plane this surface was planarized it would have certain area but now we have carpet on it so at micro scale even macro scale it has roughness on this surface so if I need to calculate the area which is there now it's much more than just a plain area because of these heights and contours so essentially on a textured surface we get much more area if we get more area we can functionalize many more molecules and we we measure this fluorescence uh, from those surfaces and by the way three gentlemen who got Nobel Prize in chemistry today they were the ones who developed this fluorescence measurement techniques Nobel Prize in Chemistry has been won by three physicists. <laughs> Again, interdisciplinary work. So, so we went ahead and made these nano textured surfaces and we have uh, seen quantifiable data where we can, uh, this, this plot is nano textured PDMS with aptamers, so we see higher cell density of this surface than the others. So what we do now is we make nano textured surfaces and uh, we are using not just aptamer, we are using the cell contour behavior also to increase the, the efficiency. So this data shows cells which are on plain PDMS. PDMS is a polymer uh, which is uh, essentially uh, used for many biomedical studies to, as a to make microfluidic channels and other things. So, and we have used glass. So, glass means the material which is used in slides, very commonly used. And once you do nano texture in PDMS, you see cells, they spread on it, they make these networks, they, they grow, they grow very well. So, that nano texture gives us something more that is not yet understood. But it's something which is, is akin to the texture of the basement membrane which exists in, in living systems naturally. So we have made nano textured with many other things. This is from using eggshells, so we can call it green nanotechnology, which is a buzzword game. So using your discarded eggshells and put it in an, an acid for a few minutes and what you get is very nice narrow texture among those and that you can use right away because they are biocompatible by itself. So we have used narrow texture with, within grooves, what we call hierarchical narrow textured substrates and there also we see that uh, number of tumor cells are much higher for hierarchical surface than uh, just a narrow textured surface. So again this is tumor cell, human glioblastoma is brain tumor cells. And these are astrocytes, which are normal counterparts of brain. So they show much more, number, many more uh, cells that get captured. So our recent data on breast cancer detection is also interesting. So these are better static cells on an aptamer that is not supposed to bind to EGFR. So we don't see any movement. We don't see any change on those cells. So they do get attached, but they don't like it. So non metastatic cells on mutant abdomen again very small changes these are non metastatic cells on the anti egfr abdomen some movement but once you put metastatic cells on anti egfr you see profound changes in the cells going from 2 minutes to 9 minutes to 17 minutes so this is just quantification that uh, metastatic breast cancer cells on anti-EGFR aptamer gives 
about 77 percent cells give us this pseudopod formation motility which can be again directly translated to a cytological tool. Now one can say okay this is done in a lab setting so how does it translate to real life so something that we are doing as electrical engineering we're developing a system also where we want to have quantifiable analytics on the cell behavior so this is example where this real cell data you can take it do simple filtering in software like matlab and you can get a, a contour map of those cells and that can be used to to quantify how does the contour change from frame to frame and that can be used to uh, get features like uh, diameter change features like area change features like contour change because area and contour are slightly different ideas but in any case this is something also that we are doing where we are building up a system built up on that and as a disclaimer we have uh, two companies that we have spun off we are trying to that sense it into into a prototype into a product so with this i would uh, wrap up take the our time and uh, conclusion our, our goal is to prepare systems prepare approaches for early cancer detection there's many reasons foremost is we want to have specific treatment for specific patients we have to have specific treatment for specific kind of cancer, metastatic, non-metastatic, <coughs> which can ultimately improve quality of life and, and improve survival rate. Uh, my, some of my new and old students they are uh, who have uh, worked on this, so this is Lukas and Nuzat who have worked on the breast cancer work and uh, my funding agencies and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two questions for 12 o'clock. Yeah. Um, when you show this uh, cells going through the micropores, uh, is there any chance that the current itself affects the cell? Yeah, so if it's a very valid question. So if the cell is exposed to higher electric field, if we are exposed to higher electric field, we don't like it and we get shocked. Cells shouldn't like it. But the time scale is too small. If you look at the number, it's, it's, it's microsecond, millisecond. So they just zap through. So our measurement is fast enough that it can measure the... But yes, once they have gone through, they might have become different. They might have because of that shock they got while they're going through. But before they go through, they have their, uh, their mechanophysical properties which are essentially different from each other. Yeah, but it can very well be because you don't know how does the cell react to that high field. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Is it your vision then that one would be able to go to a doctor for just a regular well person checkup? and have a small amount of blood drawn and then have that, that blood pass through over some of the surfaces you were describing and have, um, say, a, a doctor be able to tell a patient right then and there or within a day, oh, we see a problem or, or everything looks fine versus what we do now is for breast cancer is at a certain age, you start going and getting mammograms, which is obviously not a nanotechnology, it's something right. you can see with the naked eye. Right. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about what, what your so, vision is for So mammogram protection? being, no, even if with its own shortfalls, it's still an effective tool. But why do we have debate? Because of the cost. So this, the cost will be one thing where you have this disposable chip, which costs maybe 10 cents a piece. Of course, you'll have cost for the system itself, but small amounts of reagents, small amount of the, the manufacturing is at small scales. You don't have too much material that's being used. So cost would be one thing that would ultimately bring it to early age. And we can do it periodically. We can do it in annual physical or biannually. Yeah, so current approaches are much more confined 
because of the cost itself, then because of the efficacy sometimes, right? And return on, on results, yeah, may, there are, maybe we can still do it fast enough with biopsy if, if doctor has just your sample, but there is a long list of sample. What we can do is automate it as well, where the behavior of the cell can be matched with the database. And we have known database, how do particular sets uh, behave and then go and match for that. So what I skip, if you look at this, this guy, so we have this whole thing where we want to compare these things and we are working in developing a database for different tumor cells and how do these features match. Right. So that would be something where a patient may not even have to go to the doctor's office. Oh. Can get the sample in and let the data be uploaded and, and sent back for evaluation, for comparison. And why? I mean, we can do that and that's not something we are doing because we have cell phones with good uh, resolution of, of those. Oh. So that's also the the direction, unique direction that we are working on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Ibatha.